Um, so you guys are the long haulers, right? You know, all the way till the end, we can do this. So thank you for being here. Um, what I was asked to talk about is what we've learned from the registry um, in 15 minutes. So <laughs> let's see if I can find this here. These are my disclosures. Um, so what have we learned? Um, and then you can fall asleep, drink some coffee, and go on to the next talk. Um, we learned that the registry can help us facilitate research. Um, it can facilitate collaboration. As we look at proposals that have come through, um, new individuals working together that hadn't worked before. Um, it can also facilitate collaboration um, from philanthropy, um, from government, um, and industry. Um, so really serving as a framework, both the care center network and the, the data in the registry to build collaborations, facilitate research. I'll show you how we were able to facilitate the precisions trial, getting off the ground. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, it's really expensive. <laughs> Um, and what we would like to be doing right now we're, is scaled back a bit just because of, of the practicalities of that B word, which uh, stands for budget. So we've heard a lot today from our plenary sessions and then later through this session even about clinical trials, how important they are, what they are. Um, and I think most of us probably realize that registries are different. They give us a different type of information. Whereas clinical trials have strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, strict protocols that must be followed, registries are designed to collect data in a naturalistic manner. Um, people sign up, and then what happens to them through the care of their, um, their providers, through life events, are captured in the registry. And, and you can design the registry by who you want to understand better, what types of patients um, you want to include in the registry, as well as what you want to capture from the registry in terms of data. Um, are you interested in looking at safety of pharmacology and you're gonna capture detailed data about drugs? Are you interested in looking at how drugs are utilized? Are people on drugs or not? Are you looking at changes in lung function over time? Um, so what you decide you want to get out of the registry really governs what the case report forms are of data collected. In terms of the PFF registry, just historically, and then where we are now and looking forward, so it started, well, the first concept started with Dan Rose, who um, I was totally moved and uh, still thinking about him, you know, after our tribute last night, you know, really started thinking about this about 10 years ago. And through a couple of years of planning and protocol development, uh, through finding funds, um, the registry, first version, we could call it, started in 2016. And it was a very traditional center-based registry. Patients came to a care center network. They met an investigator who gave them an informed consent document. They signed the informed consent document. And they gave permission to collect their data from whatever happened at that center over the next up to five years. They also had the opportunity to give a blood sample. And they also got questionnaires, patient-reported outcomes every six months that they were asked to fill out. That changed, we stopped collecting data in that registry a year ago. All those data are still there, they're still open for business in terms of research questions, but they're not growing any further. And what we've been doing since July of 22 is what we're calling the community registry, which I'll give you more information towards the end of this talk, but it's more of a subject directed, so it, it doesn't center at the care centers. They can be at the care centers, but it could be anywhere. And patients, family members, um, caregivers, um, lung transplant recipients, any of those populations can sign up and enter their data into what we're calling the, the community registry, which is really just the next version of, of how this registry is moving forward. What did we collect in the first version of the registry? So a lot of clinical data, um, you know, your age, you know, did you smoke, are you on oxygen, what are your medications, what are your comorbidities? So a lot of, a lot of clinical data. A huge resource were CT images. So, you know, CT, we've heard, you know, heard great talks yesterday about, you know, beyond HRCT, where are things going? Um, and saw data that were published by Steve Humphreys from, from the registry data. So subjects or centers in, uh, in were able to upload the data, not names and things like that, but the data from a CT scan that was closest to the time of enrollment, so maybe a few months before or whenever that was, and then two subsequent CT scans, because we wanted to try to get longitudinal CT scans in the registry. We had four patient-reported outcomes that were utilized, a general health, a shortness of breath, a cough instrument, and a fatigue scale. 
captured hard, horrible outcomes like hospitalizations, mortality, needing to get a lung transplant. And then patients, subjects had the option to give us a blood sample uh, to be put into a biorepository where it was divided into aliquots, DNA, RNA, um, serum plasma, that then researchers could request those aliquots to use for, for more pathobiological or biomarker studies. And about 90% of people did that. And of those that didn't, most of the time it was more of a logistic thing. It's five o'clock on a Friday and the lab's closed, um, things of, of that nature. At the heart of all this was trying to improve outcomes for our patients, have better quality, better quantity of life, and to use the registry and the care center network to help facilitate research, to understand practice patterns. Um, a recent publication from the registry showed that outcomes across different care centers are different. Next step could be to dive down and say, why might that be? Can we identify care patterns that make a difference? But the first step was, yeah, outcomes were different. Maybe that was just luck. Maybe if you looked three years later, the outcomes would switch. Maybe it's just variability. But there were differences. Um, data from the registry could be used for advocacy. You know, um, are you on oxygen? Well, your hall walk showed that you were hypoxemic, but you're not using oxygen. Why is that? Um, and then community engagement, being able to reach back out to the community as Andy Limper, creating that army of PF warriors uh, to help conquer this disease. If people talk about the flagship of, of registries, they'll often mention, well, what about the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, right? You know, huge registry, lots of resources now, has done incredible things to improve the lives of patients with cystic fibrosis. But what's often not noticed, and actually I didn't realize it until I saw this publication a number of years ago, is it took a long time. All right, so it started before I was born in the 60s, evolved over time, over time, over time. It went from paper-based, electronic-based, capturing more data. As data were found to be important, they modified what data were captured. So these registries take a long time to develop, and I think it's important that registries do develop, that we evolve over time, and learn from what we did well or what we could do better and keep evolving as we move forward. We have a much more condensed timeline. You know, this is our timeline. It doesn't go over 50 or 60 years. It goes over five or six years. Um, with the concepts starting about eight or nine, 10 years ago, first patient was enrolled in 2016. We had a budget for up to 2,000 patients and to follow them for five years. And we enrolled those 2,000 subjects in just over a year. So there was rapid enrollment. And the enrollment wasn't limited because people didn't want to participate. In fact, we had to shut the doors and tell people, sorry, we don't have any more room for you to enroll. So there was much more interest and ability to enroll more subjects. It was just limited by, by budget. Takes some time for data to get in the registry, right? You get baseline data, but then you really want that six month, 12 month, 18 down the road. But over the next couple of years, we started to see abstracts come out and then lots of publications. And cool publications of, of groups partnering between industry and academics working together on projects, different types of, of non-CCN investigators working with CCN investigators um, to answer questions. When the registry closed uh, for data entry, which was about a year ago, the fall of 22, um, again, there was just over 2,000 subjects that were enrolled, um, had almost just over 1,600 specimens in the biorepository, just shy of 3,000 CT scans, raw data from HRCT scans for research, data on over 8,000 clinical visits, almost 15,000 pulmonary function tests. So just a huge amount of data that are there um, and available for research. Still now, you can submit proposals to utilize the data. The data are just not growing forward. The patients that were in the registry, you'll notice that 60% of the patients had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That was by design. Um, the thought behind that was, we just had the approval of profenadone and atenidib. We understood what we thought was a fair amount about disease behavior and IPF, but most of what we understood about disease behavior and IPF, either on placebo or one of the two approved agents, was from phase three clinical trials. A little bit narrow inclusion criteria, very strict protocol. So one idea of the 60% was to have enough patients with IPF that we could kind of compare the, the clinical trial experience to more of this real world experience. 
And so that's why we targeted 60% of patients having IPF. As we've moved forward, we've taken that off. And now anybody with different types of fibrotic lung disease can enter the registry, and there's no caps on any specific diagnosis. And this was fine. I could have made three of these slides. Um, but this was just looking back at papers um, and things that have come out of the registry. And I think one of my favorite sessions, besides all of you, but one of my favorite sessions before all of you, um, was talking to the patients about the registry. Um, and having them raise their hands and, you know, a quarter of the people in the room were part of the registry. And I could tell them that if they hadn't participated, if they hadn't been courageous and participated in the research, this would be a blank slide. And every one of these questions that has an answer would still be a question. So, yes, it's facilitated research, answering questions. It's also facilitated clinical trials. Um, so we know the backstory of the precision study, right? So we used to use immunosuppression. We added NAC to it. It looked like NAC plus immunosuppression was good. But then when we studied placebo, NAC alone, or triple therapy, immunosuppression plus NAC, we were all very dismayed. We were scared. We were saddened. We were lots of bad adjectives when the DSMB stopped. Uh, because what we thought was our winning combination was actually harmful compared to placebo. Increased hospitalizations, mortality. You've heard me say, and many of us are the same, you know, we made a lot of phone calls that week, right? You know, Mrs. Smith, you should stop that medicine. I'll tell you why later. Um, so this helped in terms of taking harm off the table. When you looked at NAC alone, it didn't look like it did anything. So that was very disappointing. But then Emory and Justin had a creative idea and said, well, people gave blood. Why don't we look back post hoc and see what that blood, if it made a difference in outcomes. And when they looked at the tollup and the polymorphisms within tollup, sure enough, depending on which uh, genotype you had, you either one in four seemed like you were harmed by being on NAC, 50% of the people in the middle didn't make any difference, and 25% may actually have been beneficial. So this led to the thinking and the planning of the precision study, actually a study of precision medicine of people that have the potentially favorable um, genotype of tollup um, to study them. So where did the registry come into this? Well, we heard a lot about difficulties in clinical trials through the last two days. And one of the huge hurdles is recruitment and screen failure. So if you can imagine if you're starting off a trial where by definition you know three out of every four patients that are willing to be in your study are not going to be eligible before you even look at PFTs or anything else on the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So huge screen failure rate. You look at that trial and you say, that's just not feasible. It's just not going to happen. You're never going to be able to get that trial accrued. Well, what we were able to do is say, well, let's wait a minute. We've got this biorepository. We've got over 1,000 patients that have given blood samples that have IPF. We can use some of that grant money to figure out what the genotypes are. And of those people that have the favorable genotype, we can contact them and say, hey, here's a study you might be interested in. Now, that wasn't enough to populate the whole study. The study is getting close to accrual. It's 200 patients, and we're at about 187, I think, as of last week. So really close. But we were able to kickstart. We were able, had a population of people that wanted to participate in research, that we already had a biospecimen, and we had permission to contact them and tell them about the study. Without the, the registry and that biorepository, I don't think this study ever would have been um, favorably reviewed by the NHLBI or moved forward. And so that's the precision study. This was a collaboration between the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and three lake partners. Um, so philanthropy, um, the NIH, um, and the foundation working together to do this study, which in AIM-1 will be the clinical trial, but probably even more powerfully, hopefully the trial's positive and we move that AIM forward, uh, but even if it's negative, um, the specimens that are collected through the study, AIMS 2 and 3 of the grant um, are dealing with proteomics and, and other ways to look at things in terms of what determines prognosis and diagnosis. So we'll learn a lot of the pathobiology by this trial moving forward, but none of this would have happened if the registry hadn't been able to be a part of facilitating it getting started. The other thing the registry allowed us to do was to figure out those 20 to 25 sites which would probably behave the best. So we had 40 some sites that were registry sites. Just like anything in life, there's bell-shaped curves where some are super performers, some are underperformers, and there's a lot in the middle. 
But we could go back to the registry data, which isn't a clinical trial, but it's something, and say, okay, which were the sites that were the fastest to contract? The least hassle, their universities got things done quickly so we aren't delayed in getting them contracted. Who enrolled the best? Who has the most IPA patients in the registry that they might be able to recruit from? And who had the best quality data? Which sites were responsive to queries? Which sites didn't have errors or a lot of unmiss or missing data? So we could look back at performance of sites in the registry. Not only did we have subjects we could look to, we could look at the sites and say, here's our rank list of sites and, and try to pick the sites that we felt would be the best performers. And so far, the sites that have agreed to participate have been doing a fabulous job, even through you know, overlapping with the pandemic, just doing a, a great job of enrolling subjects. Another um, collaboration um, example is prolific. Um, so this is a, a group of industry partners working together with Sabre, the Data Coordinating Center, to look at potential biomarkers. The different types are listed there, and they may not be the right ones, they probably aren't. But there may be some that are helpful there, and we'll get data and we'll move forward. So again, by having the biospecimens there, by having the data that went along with them, it allowed industry to come together, work together as a team to try to look at these biomarkers. There are lots of unanswered questions. I'm not gonna read through these. We can come up with two or three slides of more unanswered questions. So how can the registry help that? So what things did we wanna do? And this is now how we move forward. I mentioned that the center-based registry um, has closed, open to use those data, but no data are going in there. But what we're calling the community registry is what it evolved into. Um, the things that we wanted to do was increase participation. We were limited by budget to 2,000 subjects, but there were a lot more. Um, by having you know, a platform, a, a web-based entry that, that subjects can enter directly, it doesn't have to be at a center, and it doesn't have to be limited by numbers. So we were hoping, are hoping, to increase diversity, spread the registry out from the care center networks, out deeper into the community to better understand what the diverse patient population looks like. We also wanted to expand beyond just the patients. We heard a lot of important discussion um, at this meeting um, about the importance of caregivers. So caregivers can enter their data into the, the registry. Patients who had a lung transplant, we can follow their data and family members. We wanted the ability to interact with subjects. In the first version of the registry, it was center-based and every center had their own institutional IRB. It started at a time where central IRBs were very uncommon and just started to be thought about. But the contact of each of those subjects had to happen through the center. So you can imagine, like, I've got this really cool question. This is a 10-patient survey that is going to change the landscape. And I want to get it into the registry. OK, that's easy. All you have to do is go through 40 different IRBs and get them to approve the protocol amendment, and then you can send it out. It's not feasible. So we lack the ability to reach out to subjects. Well, we don't lack that anymore. The community registry moving forward now has a central IRB, one IRB. When subjects give consent, they check a box, yes or no, I am willing to be contacted for future research. It's voluntary, they don't have to do that. But 90% of people have said, yeah, contact me. Tell me about studies that might be in my area. Or those surveys that you're talking about that you have new questions that you really want to get now those data into the registry, we can send it out. And those data can fall back into the registry. So now we have a really powerful way to interact with participants um, across what will hopefully be a huge community. Again, this single IRB allows us the flexibility to add different types of data points. It minimizes site burden. One of the things we want to do, um, as soon as the money tree germinates and starts you know, giving us $100 bills, um, we would like to reopen the site registries and have them complement each other. Have subjects in the community registry also be enrolled at the center where the center could enter different types of center data to complement what the subject's entering. Okay. So we have the patient registry, we have the community registry. How do people join? They go to the website, they click on a, on a, a link that takes them to an electronic informed consent document, they fill out the information, then they get forms, 
There's an hour or two maybe of baseline forms to fill out, but people can come and go. And then every six months, they get a reminder to ask to update any information. I'll be honest, and if you get feedback from, from people that you take care of, the, the database that we started with from you know, an academic standpoint was REDCap, or is REDCap, so very, very secure, very, very good, very, very unuser friendly <laughs> okay? Um, so right now we're in the process of putting out uh, requests for applications for a vendor that won't minimize the security or the analytic abilities of the database, but will give us a better face page so that our, our patients, our subjects, aren't frustrated by a clunkiness of what we in academics are used to using. And I mentioned, we're collecting data on patients, caregivers, and family members. A lot of the information overlaps, but there are differences. So for caregivers, there's a, a caregiver burden interview. So we can actually get a patient-reported outcome on the impact of being a caregiver from people that report themselves as caregivers. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you. I don't know. Are we waiting for questions at the very end? Or okay, okay. So I'll be back. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for sticking it out to the end. Um, what I want to do here is take on from what we started talking about this morning. Um, the plenary discussion was excellent on setting up the background about what is an adaptive clinical trial, and we're going to go into what are we trying to do for uh, our patients with ILD. So we'll, I'll talk about Remap ILD, where we are and where we are going with this. These are my disclosures. So first of all, what is Remap? It's a randomized, embedded, multifactorial adaptive platform trial. So randomized, meaning that patients are randomized to all interventions for which they are eligible and consent to. So remember, we're talking about an, uh, an adaptive trial where there are multiple um, interventions that are being tested. So embedded, this study protocol, the master study protocol, uh, will strive to embed this clinical, um, embed the trial into routine clinical care. So we are trying to minimize the effort from the site end and make it easier for the patients to participate in the trial. So it reflects standard practice of care and uh, minimizes all the study procedures. Then multifactorial means that multiple interventions, multiple drugs are being tested at the same time. And patients can be randomized to multiple treatment domains. Now, in, a, in our routine trials, there's single arm, there's one drug that is being treated, and there are, there's a placebo arm for that each trial. So, at, so thinking about multiple drugs that are being studied at the same time, and there is one control arm here. And that it really, for the patient, it increases the probability of re receiving at least one active treatment rather than a control drug. Um, and adaptive, we talked in detail about this this morning. The information that is acquired during the trial will allow us to learn more about the disease process, to learn more about how this trial is progressing, and then make changes based on certain pre-specified procedures um, according to the protocol. And then finally, platform. This is really what we're striving to build. A perennial infrastructure that is developed with the objective to generate a continuous learning system. So as we learn more, um, some medications may go into clinical practice, some medications don't work, they're out, and then new medications are being evaluated here. And the advantage of that is it minimizes all the time it takes to go from doing a phase one study, you learn something, and then you go through the whole regulatory budgeting process, takes time, then you go to the phase two, phase three, and Dr. Case showed that wonderful slide this morning about how long it takes for uh, drug development in patients with ILD. And our goal is to try to build this perennial platform where we can keep putting in new drugs that have, um, that have shown um, promise in um, treating patients with ILD. So why are we doing this? We, we know, we've talked about this you know, for the last two days. There's an urgent need for newer and better treatments for our patients with fibrotic ILDs. The, currently, the way we do this is it's randomized traditional uh, conventional parallel trials. Um, they evaluate a single investigational process, product. Um, there's a pre-specified treatment arm, pre-specified sample size. But with adaptive platform trials, which we saw the success that we've seen with COVID, with community acquired pneumonia, with re remap cap, um, it can be done, um, and so um, that's really why we're thinking about this. What are the limitations, though? Why are we, you know, why can't we keep doing what we're doing? 
there are certain limitations to traditional um, pathways to drug development. One, you know, it does take a lot of time. When you think about the trial design, there's a need for a large sample size that is, in de that is dedicated to that particular investigational drug. The study duration can be fairly long just because of that purpose. Um, and then there's a lack of generalizability of data because there can be homogeneous different study cohorts from across the world. Um, and then, you know, then it's equally likely all of our trials are placebo controlled trials. And so we keep talking about, you know, when I approach our patient, there's a 50-50% chance that you'll get the study drug versus the placebo. Can we minimize that? Um, and so, and then there's finally the, a limited incentive to design head-to-head -head trials. Of, of treatments even that have been approved. We can't do that in our traditional trial designs, but with REMAP, that might be possible. And there's a lot of treatment that we do that we don't have adequate um, you know, data for. There's smaller studies, for example, with patients with fibrotic HP. Some, some of us do immunosuppression. Some of us do antifibrotics, but you know, the data there is not sufficient. Yes, if they're progressive, we have some data for that now. But is that enough? I mean, and there's, and there's no way to design a trial, like a traditional trial, to give us those answers. And then going to operational factors, it's not just about how the trial is designed, but there are site-related issues that can come up and limit um, what we do with the traditional pathway. There's sponsor-related. I mean, all the companies are putting in, they have high operational costs, again, because we're all trying to build in separate placebo arms, separate treatment arms, and there's a lot that goes into it. And then finally, study-related um, issues that come up with like lack of open data, the slow identification, it takes a longer time to do this. And then finally, and most importantly, though, are patient-related factors. How can we make trial participation easier for our patients? Um, a lot of times with the traditional pathway, what we're trying to do, and it, is, it has been essential to keep rigor in how we collect data, but a lot of our patients travel long distances. They're not able to come see us every month and get PFTs or you know, even just come visit us, or somebody has to take time off to drive them for trial participation, and that limits... Um, the trials that our patients can really participate in. And so by embedding this into routine clinical practice, we're trying to minimize these factors for our patients. So that's how, you know, eventually REMAP ILD became a thought. And this was really, it has been spearheaded by Dr. Gisley Jenkins um, and Leticia, Dr. Leticia Kamano. Um, and it is really an international collaborative initiative that um, with the goal of rapidly and efficiently testing new, new drugs, but also thinking about how we can answer some of the questions of repurposing some of the drugs that are currently available and, and have potential. Um, in terms of the study design, um, again, we're trying to embed this in clinical practice as much as possible to minimize the, um, you know, minimize site level efforts as well as pa increase patient participation. Um, so, but data regarding pulmonary function tests, data on mortality and hospitalizations, patient reported outcomes, um, adverse event monitoring will be done throughout the study. And some other measurements may be considered, which include genetic um, data for to, um, in, in areas that, in regions that this is, this is possible, or um, there might be some certain domain specific um, study measures that we may think about um, obtaining as well. Again, that may be region specific or domain specific. Now this slide is where, you know, it looks very simple, but it's not. I know we've talked a lot about how do we identify what the primary endpoints should be for our clinical trials. There's been a lot of discussion. Yes, we do utilize FVC. Is that the best? Does that really reflect what our patients are feeling? I mean, from practice, I can tell you, you know, patients come in, I say, oh, look, your FVC is stable, but doc, I still can't walk to my mailbox, right? You know, the, it's not truly reflective of how the patient is feeling. So how can we um, bring all of that information in um, into our um, clinical trials is still something we're working with. But for, um, and then most randomized controlled trials um, you utilize a frequentist sta statistics, which basically mean that um, you calculate the probability of observing patterns from a trial um, if the hypothesis is true. And, you know, this has worked, but the, there are some pre-trial assumptions that are made uh, when, when we calculate the sample size, when the trial is designed. Um, but and these trials lack the flexibility, though, as we learn uh, from the trial as the enrollment goes in, to actually make changes or be reflective of clinical practice. So what um, REMAP will do is rely on a Bayesian approach. Um, it's a mixed uh, measures 
it measures a mixed model, but it's encompassing both the trajectory of FEC decline as well as um, the hazard for mortality. It'll be a one-year study. This will be over a time frame of, um, of, 12, of 52 weeks. So some of the terminologies. Now, when we talk about remap, these terminologies will come up, and we're in the process of um, publishing this paper on the concept of remap and what it really means, how are we designing this. But these are some of the terminologies that we all um, would want to be familiar with. So factor is the intervention. It, these are mutually exclusive interventions which are categorized then within domains. Now, domains are then categories of like mutually exclusive interventions. So for example, you have antifibrotic therapies, you have profenadone with nintodanib, a new antifibrotic therapy, and then there's a control. Now, these are all factors in the domain of antifibrotic therapy. And then we'll have other domains, which will include immunomodulatory uh, domain, senolytic domain, um, steroids. Eventually, we want to look at pulmonary hypertension as a domain, bring um, rehab as a domain. But these are uh, the, the four listed are what we are currently looking at. And then finally, a regimen. Regimen is a collection of factors that a patient is randomized to. Like I said, a patient, this is a multifactorial study, so meaning multiple drugs are being evaluated at the same time. And an eligible patient can be on two different study medications at the same time, um, or they can be in the control arm. But it is possible for them to be in multiple um, domains at the same time as well. And finally, we have the strata. The, this is a baseline disease characteristic. So is it IPF? Is it a non-IPF ILD? And that would be important because you don't want to you know, randomize a patient uh, with IPF into the immunomodulatory um, domain. And so these factors will be then um, taken into consideration at the time of randomization. So this is how the study's design will look like. This, is, this was um, really adapted from the REMAP CAP. Um, study protocol. So you have a patient with fibrotic ILD. Um, you first look at the remap entry criteria. So it's the entire study entry criteria. And then we go into the domain-specific exclusion criteria. Once they've met the big, uh, big inclusion criteria, then there are, each domain has specific exclusion criteria. And so based on those criteria, they will be then randomized into different interventions within the domains that they're eligible for. Um, and over the study period, there'll be um, um, in, interim analysis done, and when the primary endpoint is met, then the decision will be made on what happens to the drug. So going into a little bit more detail, so let's look at domain A, for example. There's three drugs and a control arm, um, and later in the trial as we go, it turns out A1 is superior. There's discussions, can this be approved? Can this come back into clinical practice? And that may become a standard of care for the controls into the future. So right, that's where an adaption is happening within the trial, where then the statistical model is adapted to allow for that drug to become um, a standard of care or you know, in the control arm. And then you go into an example for domain B, you have B1 and B2. Now these drugs, um, you go through the trial, look at the data, but you know B2 is definitely not working, but there's question about whether they can be low dose versus high dose of B1, so the B2 is now out. B1 in low dose and high dose will continue in the treatment arms. Um, domain C gives you an example of equivalence, and then that will be left to the clinician on whether we utilize these drugs or how we do that. Um, so this is how the trial is designed, and these are some examples. So uh, moving on from that to then the governance, um, it is complicated. We're trying to do this at a global level. So this was initially started with the International Trial Steering Committee, which has a rotating leadership. Um, but then from that, there's the, the big groups are the regional management committee groups. So we have the um, US, UK, um, Europe, Brazil, Australia, um, Japan is still getting on board. There are others that we're taking into consideration for the future. And the other parallelly working groups are the domain-specific work groups. The most active, we've been looking at antifibrotics, we're looking at synolytics, um, we're looking at immunomodulation and prednisone. So these are the big ones, the, the major domains that um, we've had a lot of discussion on and are working on the protocols for that. And then eventually we'll have like more about disease state working groups. We want to think about how we bring ILA into this um, trial design. How do we get acute exacerbations? How do we account for those? How do we study these other conditions? And, and those will be discussions that will take place as well. So moving forward, this is where we are currently. So moving forward, now this 
is where the whole village takes the village, right? That's what we heard this morning. It does take a village, and we all need to come together. The governance structure is currently in place, but um, you know, always welcome to join if you're interested. Um, potential treatments to test are being discussed uh, very actively within the domain-specific work groups. International collaborations are being built um, you know, across all the um, different regional management groups. Worldwide funding. Now, this, of course, is going to be a challenge. We initially have, uh, we had an NIHR grant, which allowed us, the consortium, to develop the statistical model that we're working on. Uh, we're utilizing the injustice and profile data to sort of build this model um, and has helped us refine the protocol for REMAP. But now there's more funding that we've applied for. Um, for different domains, for different interventions um, within US, UK is applying this month, Brazil and Europe have applied for antifibrotic therapies, and so eventually the goal is to be able to unify all of this, but we do have to start it at the regional level um, at this stage. And then um, the Berry Consultant Group has been helping us um, build a statistical model, and um, we're working with them. And then finally, building our community, and this is where everybody comes in. Um, you know, we recognize that building a global infrastructure is not easy. It is, it is a huge undertaking that we're um, working with here. There are several strengths to adaptive trial approaches. Most of them have been done in a regional level. Um, how do we do this at a global level? And, um, you know, we have to take other things into consideration. How do we build this master protocol? What are the um, challenges that will come up in various clinical settings or various uh, regional settings, you, you know, we do not expect that there will be like new therapies, like how what happened with COVID. Yes, it was very rapid turnover. The time frame was really short on that, um, and there was a lot of funding that went into it. Um, you know, development of um, drugs to remap ILD may not be as rapid, but, you know, at least we are hopeful that we'd be able to um, identify a few effective therapies, and but more importantly, also disregard some non-effective therapies, like learning what therapies that we're currently doing is actually not helpful. I mean, we learned from, um, you know, it's been a few years since we had our lesson with prednisone and azathioprine for IPF, but, you know, are we doing things that we shouldn't be doing? You know, learning even that would be really um, important. And eventually, you know, hugely um, valuable in advancing therapeutic strategies for um, our patients with ILD. It takes a village. We all need to get together. Uh, it needs to be a partnership between you know, academicians, patients, industry, stakeholders, finally, um, to, to make this a reality. So with that, you know, finally, I want to you know, reflect what our patient said this morning. Hope is not a strategy. We can't just keep on that anymore. We need to make this happen. We all need to come together, and hopefully we'll see that. Thank you on behalf of the REMAP ILD Consortium. Well, it's very good to see everyone still in the room here, and... Uh, we, there's a, a, something for every, everybody today, quite frankly, during this discussion. So I was tasked with introducing preclinical models and drug development in IPF. So uh, if you have flights later this evening, I suggest you change. No, I'm kidding. I, I, won't, I, I, won't, I won't go over my allotted time, uh, but uh, I certainly have to start with uh, disclosures and, and conflicts of interest. And uh, where I'm going to start this uh, presentation is here. Uh, and this was what I would view as an incredibly valuable workshop that was held at the NIH in Bethesda in, in November of 2012. Quite frankly, it's time for another workshop from my perspective, but this workshop was amazing in terms of the breadth of expertise that was brought together. Some of you might see your name in the authorship list here. Uh, and this publication that came out in, in 2014 highlighted, you know, some of the important uh, issues that revolved around preclinical modeling. And I'm not going to delve into all of the issues. I'm sure many of you in the room are aware of the challenges we have in modeling idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and, quite frankly, any other type of progressive ILD. So the first recommendation was that new tra treatments should be studied during the fibrogenic phase as well as the inflammatory phase. So uh, during this summit, and I'm sure in many other meetings you've been to, uh, we still grapple with understanding uh, how to distinguish these two phases, but we really need to understand how they're involved in uh, 
fibrogenesis or, or, or the development of fibrosis. The evaluation of fibrosis should be done using a number of measures, so one being uh, biochemical measurement as well as histologic measurements. We certainly need to appreciate the role of aging. You're all aware of, of how aging impacts uh, the severity of, of inter progressive interstitial lung diseases. But I'm going to expand then on uh, this particular point that was raised during this meeting. And this is the use of what we refer to as humanized models of lung fibrosis. And really, uh, the journey from that meeting has revolved around how best to develop these types of models. So while I was at the University of Michigan, I collaborated with a number of fantastic physicians and MPHDs, uh, two of whom are shown here, Glenda Trujillo, as well as Fernando Martinez. And utilizing uh, surgical lung biopsy tissue, we developed protocols in which, uh, obviously with appropriate IRB approval, uh, we uh, generated uh, various types of fibroblast lines from these particular uh, biopsy tissues. And those fibroblasts then became a source of cells then that we introduced into a particular uh, strain of mouse, uh, the CB17 skid beige mouse. And at the time, this was circa 2010, uh, maybe even a little earlier. This was really the, uh, the only mouse that we found in which we could adoptively transfer uh, IPF cells in particular. And the presence of these IPF cells then in these mice led to a fibrotic process that we could measure at the transcript level, as shown here by the presence of collagen 1A1 in a time-dependent manner, as well as histologic evidence that the presence of the IPF fibroblasts, but not the normal lung fibroblasts, were driving a fibrotic process that we could then monitor in these mice. So we did a number of studies to convince ourselves that um, you know, these human cells were indeed driving a fibrotic process that was unique to the lungs of these mice. So we didn't see this fibrotic process uh, appear or evolve in any other organ system that we interrogated. So we utilize these approaches in which we labeled these cells with vital dyes. I'm showing an example here of PKH26. Again, through uh, intravenous injection of these primary human cells, again from IPF surgical lung biopsies, we could, we could localize these cells using you know, a number of different uh, techniques. One being immunofluorescence, so those red dots indicate the presence of the human cells in the lungs of these mice. There were various markers uh, that we identified uh, using uh, transcript analysis, so this would be quantitative PCR analysis. Many of these markers we're still employing in our studies today. And then, you know, the all-important histologic as well as biochemical evidence that uh, these introduced human cells are, are driving the fibrosis and I would say, just as importantly, causing a persistent fibrosis. So one of the challenges we have with other forms of studying fibrosis, particularly in a rodent model, is that that fibrosis will resolve over time. That was not what we were seeing with this model. So the introduction of these human cells then was really setting up a fibrotic process that persisted. This is just some flow cytometry uh, showing you and highlighting that we could also identify these human cells in not only the lungs, uh, so this was lung tissue, this is the lavage fluid from the lungs of those mice, but also these cells were ending up in other organ systems, including the spleen. But as I mentioned, the presence of those cells in an organ like the spleen didn't lead to any kind of fibrotic process that we could see either histologically or biochemically. Now, we've, we've looked at a number of targets, and, and really it's my mission as a biomedical researcher to ensure that, uh, you know, pipelines are full and that patients are, uh, you know, at, at a point where they're going to receive therapies that are going to make a, dis, a, a difference in disease course. So we've utilized that, this particular type of skid model then to look not only at uh, factors that are attenuating this fibrotic process driven by primary IPF fibroblasts, but we've also looked at, to, at various interventions and, and some of them being drugs that seem to exacerbate the fibrotic process. And those are, are the um, 
uh, agents that are listed at the top of this slide. Fortunately, it's a very short list, but we're always mindful of testing uh, various types of uh, agents, compounds, antibodies, and the like uh, to ensure that they're not uh, exacerbating the fibrotic process. Now, as with any type of modeling approach, there are lessons to be learned. And in this case, I have to eat a little bit of humble pie, which is always good to eat every once in a while. Uh, and this revolves around a cytokine that, that many of you in the room might be aware of, and that's interleukin-13. So in 2014, we published this paper in the Red Journal in which we characterized the targeting of IL-13 with trelokinumab uh, in uh, this lung fibrosis model I've just described to you, uh, a humanized skid model of IPF. The, the data were quite impressive. We uh, you did, uh, I would say, a very thorough job of trying to understand how this antibody then interrupted, uh, even ameliorated the fibrotic process that was uh, driven in this model setting. However, the, the clinical trial, the phase two randomized control clinical trial said otherwise, and that is the, the use of trelokinumab in subjects with IPF uh, really was a failure. A uh, primary endpoint was not met, and uh, clearly, the question became, why is it that our animal model missed uh, this important uh, point? And so we went back to find out why this particular therapeutic intervention failed. And I would say that this is an exercise that doesn't happen enough in medicine, period. Never mind IPF or pulmonary fibrosis, but there isn't enough time devoted to understanding failure. And so we said, okay, we need to go back and we need to look at exactly what's happening when we're targeting interleukin-13 in this humanized skid model. So the, uh, the top of the slide is just showing you um, the setup of that experiment. And, you know, we were able to confirm that, you know, key biomarkers that are relevant to the IL-13 pathway were impacted in these mice at the transcript level. However, there was something that was surprising to us, and that is that neutralizing IL-13 using this antibody was not attenuating transcript signatures for various fibrotic factors, and I'm highlighting fibronectin-1 here. And in fact, when we took another agent um, that actually selectively targets IL-13 receptor-expressing cells, so the premise here is that you're uh, delivering an agent then that has uh, a toxin attached to it. That toxin is not active until it's internalized inside the cell. So it's a Trojan horse approach then to targeting cells that are responsive to IL-13. We refer to this agent as IL-13-PE. Now IL-13-PE was quite effective in attenuating the fibrotic process. Uh, at least histologically as well as biochemically. So that matched up beautifully with what we saw with the antibody against IL-13. However, again, looking at this transcript signature, looking to see what was happening to key components of extracellular matrix, this is where we saw the shocking difference, and that was in the anti-IL-13 antibody treatment groups, there was really no attenuation in the expression of these uh, fibrotic transcripts. We saw no histologic evidence or biochemical evidence of fibrosis, and yet, shockingly, we saw that there was still this active fibrotic transcript signature. So another very import important lesson around targeting IL-13 is that the fibroblast is not the only cell type that's responding to IL-13. And yes, we've learned a lot by using these approaches of introducing these primary IPF fibroblasts into immunodeficient mice. We're all very aware of the fact that the lung is comprised of a very heterogeneous groups of cells. And the single cell RNA sequencing efforts that have uh, been undertaken over the past five years have, have given us a remarkable picture of just how diverse those cell types are. And so what we did in, after moving to uh, Cedar sinai and again working with a fantastic group of scientists and physicians uh, was to explore how various cell types that we can now derive from lung explants, so this is post-transplant, 
could then give us a picture in terms of how these freshly isolated cell populations then were evoking fibrotic processes uh, within immunodeficient mice. Our major challenge, quite honestly, up until this point, we had thought about doing this a number of years prior, but there really wasn't a mouse that was available that would allow us to do this type of xenograft. So even in that CB17 skid beige mouse, there was enough of a residual immune response in the mouse that when we introduced human immune cells, the mouse immune system eliminated them. Now, they weren't able to eliminate the IPF fibroblasts, but they were able to isolate the immune cells. So it was really the advent of this uh, mouse here. This is a nod skid IL-2 receptor gamma deficient mouse, which we refer to as the NSG. So this, this mouse, I would say, has really revolutionized these xenograft approaches, and it's used in a, a number of different settings. Uh, but I will show you what we've uh, found with this particular approach then in introducing uh, a number of different cell types, or quite frankly, all of the cell types that we can isolate from explanted IPF lung. And what we see over the time frame here, again, limited to 60 days, but We've, we've gone out further than that, uh, is a fibrotic process that, for all intents and purposes, looks very similar to what we see in uh, the context of, of fibroblast injection alone. Now, the flow cytometry is just highlighting that there are a number of different cell types present in this cell mixture uh, as is injected into these mice. Uh, the uh, the photo micrograph there is indicating what those cells look like in a tissue culture dish. And when we first started doing these studies, uh, my postdoctoral fellows were very concerned that there weren't enough fibroblasts in this mixture in order to evoke a, a fibrotic process in, in a skid mouse. So they did uh, additional studies in which fibroblasts were added into these uh, cultures, and the result was the same. So we don't need to add uh, exogenous fibroblasts, fibroblasts that we've cultured in the manner that I showed you previously in the presentation, but that the introduction of just these explanted cells now taken from the lung explant will cause a fibrotic process. In the interest of time, I'll just move quite quickly. We're able to use approaches where we distinguish the uh, IPF cells from those of the mouse using this particular labeled NSG mouse. We're also able to transfer these uh, IPF cells into skid mice, re-isolate them, and then do a secondary challenge in skid mice. So this is a, a very common approach in oncology to look at um, the, uh, uh, whether there's been an impact on the, in this case, tumor cells as a result of, of being placed into a skid mouse. What we see is that these IPF cells remain very robust even in the secondary system. We've heard a lot about progression, and this is a very important question and, and one that we often miss in our animal modeling approaches. And it's one that, that we have uh, certainly tried to address with this skid modeling approach, bearing in mind that patients show these uh, very different courses of disease. So we've uh, utilized then uh, lung cells from patients who showed uh, varying courses of disease, so either slow or rapid. And I'm just showing you an example in which we used a CX04 inhibitor. Um, this is an experimental compound uh, it, that was developed for the targeting of this particular chemokine receptor. Uh, and what we noted was that in both uh, the, this, at least the setting of, of this animal model, that regardless of where these, these cells were derived from, from that AMD 3100 was able to significantly attenuate the fibrotic process. Uh, this drug uh, is just far too difficult to use in a clinical setting uh, because of uh, the safety uh, issues around it. So we've pivoted now towards other approaches. I'm showing you one example here of an FRNA3 receptor antibody because it is very challenging to target the prophibrotic effects 
that we see particularly from patients who've shown a rapid course of disease. So this model then allows us then to, to explore uh, uh, the full spectrum of progressive uh, ILD. A number of studies uh, are underway, I would say, at this point, um, which we're looking at novel agents for attenuating the fibrotic process. But we are mindful of clinical failures. So we've done studies around the LOXL2 antibody in particular to try to understand again uh, why uh, that antibody didn't work in the clinic like we expected it to. So what have we learned? Uh, the IPF but not normal lung mesenchymal cells uh, induce a persistent pulmonary fibrosis in immunodeficient skid mice. Uh, these fibrotic changes are limited to the lung, even with this mixed cell model that I just described. Uh, the, the fibrosis is unique to the lung. Uh, we're still trying to figure out why that is, but the lung is very, very susceptible to the presence of, of these IPF human cells. The, the model that I just described with the mixed cells exhibits a fibrotic response that is more challenging to target, uh, and then clinical progression is a key factor to consider. I've highlighted uh, a few of the folks that, that I've worked with over the years. Certainly, uh, you know, none of this work would be possible without the dedicated bi biomedical scientists and clinicians that I've worked with over the years. And this is uh, certainly a, a very important component of any researcher's life, and that is where's the funding coming from and how can we move forward uh, in uh, testing and, and translating uh, these therapies into the clinic. So thank you. And uh, th there's a paper here if you want to look at this more closely. Thanks.